Video games have been a huge part of my life since I got my Nintendo DS and a copy of Animal Crossing Wild World when I was seven. Many video games have had a big impact on my person, games I consider important part of the story of my life and who I've come to be. They've also been a pivotal part of my online experience. The reason I got into actively watching YouTube was that one time in August of 2013, when I was 15, a friend and I were downloading The Sims 3 onto her PC, and she suggested that while we wait, we watched El Rubio's The Sims 3 videos. I wouldn't recommend them now though. I haven't watched them in years, but I know I would find them unfunny and probably offensive to some degree. When I left her house, I went straight home and started binge watching his content, which was mostly video game related. It was through him that I found my way into the YouTube gaming space, so I guess I have him to thank, kind of? I slowly started to watch more and more YouTubers, and in a few months, YouTube became my primary source of media consumption. And it still is today, now at 23. I've watched YouTube almost every single day since that August of 2013. It's kind of crazy to say out loud. I watched loads of let's plays that introduced me to games I didn't know that much about, like The Last of Us, Silent Hill, Skyrim, Outlast, Catherine, Minecraft, and a bunch of others. I somehow never encountered anything related to Gamergate and only found out about it in like 2019. Probably because I was watching Spanish YouTube at the time. I don't know, but thank fuck. Even though I've spent most of my life playing video games, before I got Breath of the Wild, I was what I guess you could call a casual gamer. After I saved and exited, the most I would do was watch Yellow Mellow play Alice Madner's Returns on her gaming channel. A game I still want to play to this day. Oh my god, it looks so cool. But when I turned 18, my secondhand blue 3DS and I moved to London for university, and my priorities changed. That year, I was too busy getting drunk four nights a week and surviving mostly off of Oreos and Walker's salt and vinegar chips to care that much about video games. So yeah, because of that mess, I didn't get the Switch and Breath of the Wild on release date. I'm actually quite annoyed that I wasn't in the loop with video game stuff back then, because they were released the day before my birthday. Imagine the euphoria I would have felt finding that out. The best birthday present of all time. I'm still mad at my messy first year student self for that and I will always be. I also didn't really watch that much video game content that year. I got really into YouTubers for a while, and that was most of what I watched. I did still watch Dan and Phil games though who introduced me to Undertale, and I am so grateful. One of my favorite games ever. Dan and Phil, please bring back the gaming channel or stream on Twitch or something. Love you, okay, bye. As fast as it came, my first uni year ended. Lord released Melodrama, which destroyed me and I'm still recovering from. So I picked my 3DS back up and started playing. That year, I was quite sad for a few reasons that aren't worth mentioning, so video games became a refuge for me. For Christmas, I asked my dad to get me the new 2DS XL, and he did, so thanks dad, love you. He also got me a video game, Miitopia, which I actually really liked and spent a bunch of hours playing. It's this cute little RPG where the characters are memes you've made and you also make the face of some of the NPCs and the bad guys. It has some life sim elements like your characters having relationships between them and those relationships affecting combat. I had a really fun time with it, I want to replay it someday. Then, around April 2018, I remembered that I really enjoyed playing Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks as a kid. I want to make a video on those games at some point. So I decided to play more Zelda games. Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, A Link Between Worlds, it's really good. Hyrule Warriors Legends. I wasn't about to buy a whole Wii U just to play Twilight Princess and Wind Waker, and I didn't know about game emulators back then, but recently my cousin let me borrow his Wii U, so I'm gonna play them soon. And as a Phantom Hourglass lover, I'm so excited to see what happens in Wind Waker. Also, Twilight Princess Link is hot, and I wanna see what's up with this wolf guy. And who is Midna, and what does she want? Therefore, I decided it didn't make sense anymore to not play Breath of the Wild, so I started saving up, and on December of 2018, I went into the game store in Westfields at Shepherd's Bush and bought my Nintendo Switch and a copy of Breath of the Wild. And I didn't know it, but that day would mark a huge before and after in my life. Breath of the Wild was unlike anything I'd ever played before. It sucked me in and made me fall in love with its gorgeous scenery, charming characters, cool promising story, breathtaking piano based music and this really hot fish guy? Prince Sidon? Why do I wanna fuck a fish? I don't know, but I do. Also a link in the rubber armor looks... good. <laughs> 
and the sheer amount of characters who don't want to bang him always makes me laugh. Recently I started to backseat game with a friend who wanted to play the game, and by backseat game I mean I was sitting next to her trying not to spoil everything and helping only when she asked, not the usual definition of backseat gaming. And before she started I joked that everyone wants to have sex with Link, thinking I was exaggerating and maybe misremembering a little. But no. Everybody wants to. Rola, the arrow lady from Kakariko. Lastly, shop lady from Kakariko. The two creepy guys outside of Gerudo Town, Bosai and Benja. The girl from the outskirts stable. Well, she likes the hero of legend as a concept more than Link the person. Gutter from the riverside stable. Sumi from the serene stable. The Gerudo Kaira. Vilia from Kara Kara Bazaar. Zelda, Sidon, Paya, Ravali. Yes, Ravali, I said what I said. Fight me. Add me to the list. Also, are we supposed to just not talk about how Link just straight up bangs Sora? Oh. <laughs> Hello. So I was hooked. I had just finished the first term of the uni year, so I had a lot of free time, which I spent playing Breath of the Wild just all of the time. It was like nothing else mattered, and it didn't. Breath of the Wild was my first proper open world game. To quote Shelby, quoting Matt from Girlfriend Reviews, I didn't know video games had me in chains until Zelda set me free. What a loser. As I left the Shrine of Resurrection, the opening cutscene was already too much for my emotional little heart. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Look. Just the way the camera panned to show all of Hyrule as the most beautiful song played let me know this wasn't gonna be just another fun Zelda game with some puzzles and some items and some goofy bad guys. I suspected nothing of the old man at first. Insert point crow king Rome boss for Amos Hyrule joke here. I don't know why I was so quick to trust a random man in a world that I didn't know, but there I was, doing his work for him, getting spirit herbs. Even though I tried to spoil as little as possible to myself before getting the game, I knew about the paraglider, and oh boy did it absolutely not disappoint. Flying off of the Grey Plateau Tower into Hyrule for the first time was unforgettable. To this day, sometimes I fast travel to Varidania at the top of Death Mountain just to glide off and simply enjoy the scenery for a little while. It's just so pretty. Oh, and tangent. I love the name Death Mountain. It's so direct. If you come here, you will die. And that's the tea. The Grey Plateau was such a good tutorial. It's big enough that you can wander around for hours just exploring and getting used to the game, but small enough that it doesn't feel overwhelming. Also, whoever made the Guardian cutscene, congrats. I was terrified and I got obliterated with a laser. Fun times. And when I unsuspectedly walked into this part of the forest and Atalus just emerged and almost killed me, it was amazing. I was so scared of every rock formation on the ground for hours after that. I know you wanna kill me and I will run away like a little bitch. Four spirit orbs later, I got the paraglider and set out into Hyrule, absolutely terrified of everything. Up until that point, the RPGs I had been playing were linear games, so this newfound freedom felt like too much to handle. There were too many options, too many ways to fail. How would I know if I was making the right decisions? The old man, uh, well, King Rome boss from his Hyrule, had told me to go find my old friend Impa. So there I went. Everything was terrifying. I was constantly afraid something would just come out and one shot me on my way to Kakariko. And they did. Meeting Breath of the Wild's Impa for the first time felt so important, so prophetic. I love that part in Zelda games where Link finds out about the threat that's looming over Hyrule this time around and that he's the one that has to save the world. This cutscene didn't disappoint. And I really like Impa's voice actress, she really sells it. Breath of the Wild's Kakariko is my favorite in the saga. It's so beautiful, the music fucking slaps, the side quests are fun, and it's a delightful little spot in the hugest of Hyrule. Also, Paye is here. Hey girl! Get late percent anyone? Y'all are weird and I am one of you. I'll get world records someday. When Impa sent me to Hatena village to meet Pura and restore the missing features of the Sheikah Slate, getting there was a journey. I went down this slope, and at the bottom there was a Yiga soldier, remember, or ninja, banana, stani, I don't know. 
but they killed me real fast. I was so scared of it happening again that I decided to climb the mountains and just follow the yellow glowing point on the minimap. Because somehow, my smooth, dumb brain didn't realize that the Sheikah Towers gave me the map, so I just vibed around for hours with no map, just raw instinct and stupidity. Getting there was an odyssey. Many times I didn't have enough stamina to reach the top of a mountain, and I just tried and tried for way too long before trying a different strategy. All because that fucking Master Goga fanboy had scared me. Somehow, I made it to Hatena village. If I could go and live there in real life, I absolutely would. It was a fun time. This guy and his cricket side quest stressed me. The curse statue got really scary for a second before I talked to her again and she gave me my heart back. And the option to buy a house felt just so cool. I love the theory that the house was Link's house before the calamity. What an interesting concept. Gets me a bit emotional if I think about it for too long. Pyrrha is one of my favorite characters. The way she's introduced makes me laugh a lot. All the gossip with the villagers at Hateno, the kids posted up on the way to the ancient lab trying to get a glimpse of her, and you get there and there she is. A tiny child that tells you that Seaman, the old guy, is the director. I'm trying so hard not to make his name sound like Seaman, but I think I'm failing. Only for him to be like, no, it's her. And then she goes, check it, got you, pranked bitch. <laughs> Delightful. Carried the blue flame talked to Pura a bunch, and it was time to go back to Kakariko. I made it back the same way I had got to Hateno, incredibly inefficiently and like a little bitch scared of an evil fruitarian, only to realize that there was a shrine right there. I had completely missed it the first time around. I spent a bunch of time trekking through the fucking mountains when I could have just fast traveled. <clears throat> anyway. Now it was time to recover a memory. Getting that first one, you know, the one, changed things. Shit became real. Seeing the champions react to the imminent war, knowing they died shortly after in painful battles with the Blights, it made it personal. It gave me a sense of urgency. Real people died. People I spent time with. People who were my friends. Who I loved. There was still hope for Zelda, but not for them. For them, it was too late. When Impa gave me the champion's tuning that I had just seen Link wearing in the memory, I got emotional. My ADHD makes me feel emotions very intensely. And oh boy, were my emotions intense in that moment. Thinking about it now, I can almost feel it again. So, there I was, champion's tuning equipped, just tasked by Impa to free the divine beasts. There were now four glowing points on my map. I chose the closest one, which turned out to be Varuda, and set out on the journey a changed man. And also a woman, cause it's like I'm a girl. You get it. I'm not gonna continue describing my journey in such detail anymore, but I do want to mention some more stuff before I go into why this game was so important to me in my real life. Breath of the Wild isn't a game with multiple endings, where depending on the choices you make, you get a vastly different story every time. The main story, should you choose to see it through, is always the same. Yes, you can free the divine beasts and get the memories in different orders, but the story never changes. You learn about what happened 100 years ago, you meet the people alive today, and get crushes on all of them, get the master sword if you want, go to the castle, and destroy Ganon. Yet, it doesn't feel like the same experience each time. In my first playthrough, for the first 50 hours or so, I was incredibly cautious and scared of every enemy, as I already mentioned. I avoided all fighting if possible and concentrated on exploration and doing shrines to get more hearts and stamina. When I set out to do the first Divine Beast, I mostly moved up the mountains because there weren't enemies there, except for a couple tutus and style monsters at night. Instead of going through the Lanero wetlands, where the devs kind of intended players on going, as they said, a bunch of Sora there to guide you. Instead, I was at the top of the mountain in Rabia Plain, where I met Cass for the first time with the Crown Beast Shrine Quest. After many, many in-game days, too many to admit, trying to tame a deer, I completed the quest and moved on to find Prince Sidon and the Inogo Bridge. After trying to glide and climb through Sodobon Highlands but failing because of the rain caused by Varuda. Yes, my way of playing was silly, not very efficient and way too cautious, but it got me where I needed to go. The game made sure of that. They put an NPC on the way that gave me information about the surrounding areas, sprinkled a bunch of shrines to pick up spirit orbs and some cool weapons from, led me into the area where the quest started with the sight of a Sheikah Tower and the promise of a new map, and put a Sora there waiting to tell me all about Prince Sidon. 
They knew people would do what I did and made sure to help us cowards too. In stark contrast, the friend I mentioned earlier who I've been backseat gaming with played with so much confidence from the beginning. Each enemy she saw, she jumped in the attack, even True Trues. With her, peace was never and will never be an option. When she first encountered the decayed guardian in the Great Plateau, she just walked up to it and started hitting it with her iron sledgehammer. It blew my mind so much that she went all in with the attack instead of shitting herself and running away like I did that I recorded it. Here it is. After getting the paraglider, away she went, killing everything that came her way if it didn't kill her first. Watching her do the shrines was an incredibly interesting and enlightening experience. The solutions that appeared obvious to me didn't even seem to cross her mind. My familiarity with the game and the different uses of the rooms also played a part in that, without a doubt. Yet, every time, with a solution I never would have thought of, she got to the end of the shrine. Vastly different journeys, yet just as efficient to get to the destination. This opened my eyes to the incredible versatility of Breath of the Wild. My friend and I's playstyles are vastly different, and our brains operate very differently, me being neurodivergent and her being neurotypical. And yet the game accommodates us both. The game is ready for both of us and everyone else. This has made me want to watch the rest of my friends play Breath of the Wild. How will each of them make this game their own? I really want to find out. I'm coming for you, Chet. And you too, Malin. Hold on to Genshin Impact while you can. This, to me, answers the main question I had when I first started playing. How would I know if I was making the right decisions? And the thing about Breath of the Wild is that almost every decision is the right decision. There's a million ways of getting to the same place. Every playthrough, every single time, is gonna be a different experience. It's gonna teach you different things about the game and yourself. I started the game being very, very scared of literally everything around me, covering away up in the mountains, making sure I wouldn't run into any monster that wasn't strictly necessary to run into. And yet I got shit done. I got to where I needed to go. And slowly I got braver and better at the game until I was just killing anything on my path just for funsies. Maybe it wasn't the best, most efficient way to do it, but it taught me things about the game like, there's always gonna be something to do no matter where you go. No trips or deviations from the set path, if there even is a set path at all, are a wasted moment. Most of what I know about the game is because I spent hours and hours and hours running around, finding little new locations, meeting new people, observing and understanding patterns of behavior and spawn rates and more video game terms I can't think of right now. When I was backseat gaming with my friend, which I did for roughly 50 hours, there were so many times where I wanted to give her advice or let her know about some little detail that wouldn't really matter but would make her experience a little bit more streamlined. But almost every time I stopped myself because I learned those things by simply playing, exploring and observing and in my opinion that's a huge part of the experience, learning all the little things. I didn't want to take the opportunity to discover those things away from her. I felt so smart every time I figured something out, like every shrine is gonna be doable from the beginning, except maybe the test of strength shrines if you're not very good at combat yet, or that there's probably gonna be a Korok seed at the top of every mountain and high formation, or that the monster masks Kilton sells you only work if the enemies are all from that species, and other types of enemies will still be able to tell you're not a monster. There aren't any wrong decisions, just a million different ways of getting to the end. As long as you kill the big bad guy in Hyrule Castle, everything you've done is the right thing to do. I didn't know where in the video to put this next part, but I really wanted to include it, so here it goes. One of my favorite memories from my early days is when I set out to the Mugojim Shrine in the Hatena region. I was walking along the coast when suddenly a massive hole on the ground opens up and reveals a Hinox, a giant red Shrek with one eye, sleeping below. It was terrifying and exhilarating. Whoever and Nintendo designed that specific area and Hinox location, I love you. Okay, I've talked a bunch about the game itself and given my very subjective opinions. Now I want to talk about the reason it was so important to me in my real life. Breath of the Wild wasn't the first game to suck me in and have me playing up to 12 hours a day. Hey, new leaf. But it was the first that had me so invested that I wanted to see what other people thought and their own journeys with the game. Shortly after starting to play, I went on YouTube and looked for content about the game. And yes, I got a bunch of stuff spoiled. In my defense, I was unhinged and had no self-control. 
I have already decided that when the sequel comes out, I'm going to watch no content about it. I'm even gonna try not to watch the trailers, but that might present some difficulties. I haven't watched any content about Age of Calamity, since I haven't had that much time to play it, and it's been hard because some of my favorite YouTubers have been posting about it. Basically, I've learned my lesson. So yeah, I probably ruined the impact some emotional moments would have had in me by seeing them first in other people's videos, and that does bum me out a little bit, but the game has so many little secrets that I still had a lot of stuff to see for the first time on my own. Okay, I wanted to touch on that before I fully went in. Now that I have, let's go. My personal story with Breath of the Wild is one of community. My investment in the game went way beyond playing the game itself. I wanted to be part of the conversation. I had so much to say, and I knew I couldn't be the only one. For the first few months, when I wasn't playing or sleeping or missing class because I was sad, I was watching other people play and talk about the game. Soon what recommended was just that, Breath of the Wild videos. I clicked on everything. 10 things I wish I knew before playing, the 10 most powerful weapons, loads of theories about the game, a million let's plays. Through all of these, I found some really cool channels. Danny Dinosaur, Celtic, Arlo, Super Butter Buns, Nintendo Black Crisis, Game Champ 3000, Point Crow, Smolland, RT Games, Girlfriend Reviews, the list goes on. Some of my personal favorite videos I found around that time are Super Butter Buns' The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild for Beginners, a hilarious video I go back to every few months because it's so good. Game Champs' Hyrule Meat series. My favorite video on there is Can You Beat Breath of the Wild's Master Mode Without Pausing? I've watched it so many times, it's so fascinating. Just all of Danny Dinosaur's Breath of the Wild videos. When he showed up to the Ganon fight with a Bokka bow, I lost it. Why did he have a Bokka bow? Weapons scale up as you beat shrines and 3D Man beasts. Where did he find it so late in the game? Did he just like have it in his weapon stash since the beginning? I don't know, but it's one of my favorite video game mysteries ever, and it makes me very happy to think about. Also, his version of Make a Man Out of You where he is training rock buddies to fight a gold book goblin in his master mode playthrough is some of the best content on YouTube. Just go watch all of his videos, he is incredibly funny. Let's get down to business to defeat this fucking little golden asshole. Arlo's Breath of the Wild review is definitely a must watch and gave me a lot of perspective on the game. I want to shout out some more video games channels that I've found since, so here we go. Etz, Kuramura, Seed Gaming, Protendo, Thomas Game Dogs, Video Game Story, Cleric, and I'm sure there's more that I'll be very annoyed at myself at for forgetting about later. As time passed and I got more and more into video game content, I started to develop an interest in speedrunning. I don't do it myself, although I really want to try, but I love watching people speedrun. The feeling of everybody rooting for this specific run, the whole community glitch hunting and then sharing their discoveries with everyone else instead of keeping it for themselves, watching someone else master a game and learn how to break it in every possible way. I don't think it'll be a surprise to anyone that I'm a fan of Point Crow. Hey guys, Point Crow here. One of my favorite streamers. He's a Breath of the Wild speedrunner and all of his content is just really fun and cool. And if you want to know more about speedrunning, its history and many different games and communities, I highly recommend the channel lowest percent. It was started by Smolent and Linkus, two awesome speedrunners and streamers, and the videos are made by many different speedrunners that are just really good quality, interesting content. Also, watch Age Bummer Guys' speedrunning is awesome and here's why video. He perfectly expresses why speedrunning is just so fucking cool, way better than I ever could, and it's just a really good video. A link to all the channels and videos I've mentioned will be in the description. And this didn't just end with Breath of the Wild for me. Now I was in the loop. I was up to date, I started listening into the conversations surrounding games, actively following game developers online, knowing what games are coming out and when, getting to understand the industry and the people in it. I wasn't just a casual player anymore, simply following the Spanish Isabel Canela Twitter account to find out when New Leaf was coming out and then not caring after I got it. New Leaf, I love you and I have a lot to say about New Horizons and maybe one day I will. Also, I love you New Horizons but things need to change a little bit. Watching other people play and review games helped me develop a more critical eye and gave me the language to express my likes and dislikes about games. I'm also still learning how the industry works and losing faith in humanity and hating capitalism more and more with each day that passes. And of course, I was introduced to many new games. Stardew Valley, Hollow Knight, Moonlighter, Dream Daddy, Super Mario Odyssey, 
Yeah, I didn't know about that one. Sorry, everybody. Go play it. It's a masterpiece. Also, SMO speedruns are out of this world. I have somehow put 400 hours into Stardew Valley alone. There are so many games that I am now discovering that I really want to play. But right now, I'm still constantly playing New Horizons. Please, someone help me. I am dying. All it is to say, holy fuck, my life in person have changed since I picked up Breath of the Wild. I cannot imagine my life if video games or the video game world weren't a part of it. I feel like I would be a very different person. I genuinely consider video games very important and life defining. And it was like that before this game, but now it's like multiplied by 1000 or maybe 10,000. I don't know, a big number. I am now in a way better place than I was back then, both mentally and geographically. The latter is kind of due to the panoramic. I wouldn't say video games are a refuge anymore, since the things and people I wanted to hide from aren't really there now. Now it's just the regular dread of living in late capitalism plus some good old depression to spice things up. So now video games are more like my most important and time consuming hobby that define a big part of my online and also real life. I am so sorry to any of my friends who've had to put up with me info dumping for hours about games they haven't played. Love you. Thank you. I've wanted to make a love letter of sorts to Breath of the Wild for a while now. As I think I've already made clear, this game has been so important to me. I started a new playthrough to record some clips for this video and I felt the magic all over again. Although I don't think I'll ever feel what I did the first time I stepped into this Hyrule, at least until the sequel comes out. Please Nintendo give us something, anything, a crumb. Replaying it echoed the wonder of my first playthrough. And I'm not alone in this. I've seen many people talk about their love for this game and how it's impacted them. And it makes me so happy to know it's brought so much goodness to people. Some even going on to name it as their favorite game of all time. I'm definitely one of those people. This makes me think that games are meant to be a shared experience. I used to think that was reserved for multiplayer games only, but I was wrong. Had I not found the communities I have, my experience with the game would have been vastly different. I don't know if I would have even gotten into it as much as I did, or gotten as much out of it, if it wasn't for the content other people had made about all the possibilities the game offers. Would I have been able to even recognize the brilliance of it, or better said, find the words to express it? I don't think so. When Animal Crossing New Horizons came out, my experience with the game was so intertwined with the experience of the millions of other people playing it at the same time. I was seeing hundreds of people's playthroughs and opinions in real time. This was my first Animal Crossing game since being in the online gaming community, and my experience has been made so much better because of it. Those first few months of New Horizons being out were amazing. It felt like I was a part of something that mattered, as silly as it sounds. And since the game came out at the same time as my country and the rest of the world went into lockdown, both playing the game and hanging out with my villagers and interacting with people in the internet became some of my main social interactions. I remember my time with Wild World, City Folk and New Leaf very fondly. But it was nothing like this. This was so much bigger than me in my room, logging into the game, finding out Stitches had moved out and crying. Why Stitches? It was all of us playing along together. Data miners were doing the Lord's work to help us understand the game better and how to get the fucking blue roses. It took me months, but I finally got them. Look at my blue rose empire. We shared our hot takes about how, actually, Tom Nook is a pretty good guy. We reminisced about how mean villagers used to be in earlier games and chanted, where is Brewster? Where is Brewster? Every time the Nintendo of America Twitter account posted anything New Horizons related, this is still happening. Where is Brewster? Everyone was sharing their islands, their dreamy lists, giving their villagers up for adoption and adopting each other's, inviting people to visit their islands where their turnip prices were high, just helping each other out as much as possible. I've met most of my Twitter mutuals by either asking for help on the New Horizons hashtag or offering someone there my help. It is worth mentioning that New Horizons is designed to be most enjoyable when interacting with others via online. Like how having up to five people watering your flowers makes it more likely for them to breed, or how you only get one color of each furniture set in your nook's cranny. I wonder why. Critics of capitalism aside, <laughs> the feeling of community was amazing, and people online are still very active, almost a year after release. I know that if I ever need help, I can hop on over to the hashtag and there'll be someone there willing to help me. And how could I forget the artwork? Thank you, Malin, for reminding me to mention it. 
There is so much incredible artwork that comes out of these communities. I myself have both Animal Crossing and Breath of the Wild prints by the incredibly talented artist Seolite on my wall that I'm in love with. In a game, you'll only get so far on your own. In his What Minecraft is Like for Someone Who Doesn't Play Games video, YouTuber Rasputin talks about the nature of Minecraft being a game meant to be shared. He says his memories of his time with the game are tied to the videos he watched of other people playing it, the hours spent building things with his roommates, and showing the game to his wife. He says the sentence, a game people enjoy talking about almost as much as they enjoy playing. I find this to be a great representation of the way I see my own relationship with games in general, how playing the games is just part of the experience, and the conversations around them takes that way beyond. Games are community. Playing alone can be very fun, yes, but it is when we share them with each other when we truly get to enjoy them to their full extent and even beyond. Everyone's different, everyone's perspective is unique. And all those experiences enrich the conversations we have around games. I know I am in big part a collection of the opinions and perspectives of the people I've listened and talked to, just like those people are too, and so are the people who inspire them. All that mixed in with our own unique perspective. The friend I mentioned earlier, who I introduced Breath of the Wild to and Backseat Game with, well, she recently got her own Switch, and I was with her when she got it. That day was incredibly special. When we were walking to the city center, we couldn't stop smiling and letting out little high-pitched noises of pure excitement. Watching her play the game and fall in love with it, it was so special for me. This feeling I had felt for a while, suddenly she shared it, and it made it much stronger. That day, unboxing her Switch and watching her start her New Horizons playthrough, of course she got that game too, was one of my favorite days ever. Recently, I was going through my Twitter drafts and I found one from that day that said, Video games, man. I love them so much. They're meant to be shared. I didn't remember typing that until I saw it right after writing the last part of this video. And it hit me. That's it. That's what it's all about. Video games are meant to be a shared experience. Breath of the Wild opened my eyes and my world to the community of video games and the wonderful experience of sharing them. And I'm eternally grateful and beyond excited to keep learning and sharing. And now, to end this love letter to my favorite game, I wanna share my favorite memory of it with you. My friend failing spectacularly to do the Dakota Shrine. Thank you for so much, Dakota. <laughs> I hope we can still be friends after this.